Hello everyone, welcome to my channel. My name is Wade Bradford and on this channel we talk about stories, books, plays, movies, all whatever I want to talk about and today we are talking about a short story called The Necklace by Guy de Maupassant, if I'm saying that correctly. I'm American so I'm just gonna call him Guy. And in particular I'm talking about the ending of this story and its impact and significance. So if you haven't read this story you might want to stop this video. I'm going to include a link down below to the short story and I will also include uh, a link to another YouTube video that, uh, that has a pretty good audio recording of it. So if you like listening to stories instead of doing old-fashioned reading, that's, that's great as long as you absorb the story first. That's what we want. All right, so we've all, we've all read The Necklace. Then let me give you, if it's been a while, let me give you a quick overview. So The Necklace is a story that takes place in the late 1800s in Paris, France, and it is about a woman named, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, Mathilde Lozou. I've heard it pronounced different ways, so we'll, we'll call her Mathilde, and I hope that I'm saying it correctly. Anyway, so Mathilde is married, but not terribly happily married because, well, she doesn't like her financial situation. She is living in, not poverty, but kind of this what she feels is this mundane middle class. And, and she has a character foil, an old friend of hers who is now a wealthy woman, and that I think makes her even more jealous. Then one day her husband receives an invitation from his work to go to a fancy party. She's not happy because she doesn't have anything to wear. She doesn't have a nice dress. So her husband says, oh, you know, I was gonna buy a rifle, but let's spend that money and we'll get you a nice dress for 400 francs. Great, I've got a dress, but I don't have anything to wear. I need some jewelry. So he says, flowers? She's like, hell no. And then uh, the husband says, hey, your, your rich friend, maybe you could borrow some something from her. So she goes to her rich friend. The rich friend says, sure, borrow something. You take your pick. And she says, I'll take that diamond necklace. And so she puts on the diamond necklace and her fancy dress and they go out to the party and it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful night. She doesn't want it to be over, but it is over. She takes a little carriage ride home with her husband, and when she gets back to their flat, she realizes that the necklace is gone. They look for the necklace, they can't find the necklace. Now here's the thing, the husband says, well, we can't tell your friend the truth because that would be scandalous or dishonorable or whatever. So the husband says, lie to your friend, we'll buy some time, then we'll go out and buy another necklace that looks hopefully exactly the same. So they find another necklace that looks basically the same and it is 40,000 francs. I think they get it a, a little discount for 36,000, which is a lot of money. So he uses his father's inheritance and he goes out and gets loans and, and visits loan sharks and they scrape up enough money to buy that necklace and then she delivers it to her friend and her friend's like, oh, well, you took you long enough. And then for the next 10 years, Mr. and Mrs. Lozel work tirelessly paying off that debt. So Mathilde, who used to have servants and used to have a, kind of a cushy middle-class lifestyle that she didn't really appreciate very much, now lives a very impoverished peasant-like lifestyle. She, 10 years later, sees her friend. Mathilde is now a very old-looking woman. Her friend, I assume the same age, still looks young and beautiful and has, has a child in a stroller. So Mathilde approaches her friend and says, hey, this is what I went through and I did all of this so that I could pay back the necklace or I could get, you know, that, that we switched, that we, that we gave you. And that's when her friend is shocked and says, oh, but Mathilde, that necklace was fake. It was barely worth 500 francs. So, pfft. so that's, that's the last line, the revelation that it is fake or paste or, you know, it kind of depends on which translation you read. The, the necklace that she was wearing was imitation diamonds, but she bought actual diamonds and then spent 10 years paying off the debt. So what does that ending reveal to us? Well, we can derive a lot of themes from the story, but one of them seems to be the old fashioned advice that honesty is the best policy. Because had the husband and wife, Mathilde and her husband, uh, not decided to, to deceive her friend uh, in order to preserve their so-called honor, then the friend would have said like, oh, you lost that necklace, shame on you, you owe me 500 francs. And they'd be like, that's it, here, here you go, there, there, there's your 500 francs. 
but because they decided to go the the honorable route uh and again, I don't know how honorable it is to, to lie to your friend about the necklace, but, but because they, they, they try to avoid scandal and shame, uh, they, they have a very hard decade ahead of them. Some people also look at the story and they, they take away this, this very negative impression of Mathilde because they see her as very greedy and, and desirous of, of upward mobility and not appreciating what, what she has. So it's... So it leaves the message of like, you should appreciate what you have. I'm actually not too critical of Mathilde because, you know, when you're reading the story, yeah, she is greedy, you know, she's very, very self-interested and uh, has that sort of, sort of shallow surface appeal that she's desiring at the beginning of the story. But at the same time, her husband is really the motivating factor that's saying we can't tell anybody and we have to work our fingers to the bone and and we have to keep up this facade so so if anything it's it's really both of them if not perhaps the husband that's uh that's more at fault by the uh by the time we get to the end of the story so the emotional impact of the story is basically ooh, that sucks and if we have empathy for the characters then we feel sorry for matilde and what she has gone through and if we don't have empathy for the characters, then we might feel like, ha ha, you got your comeuppance. But getting a little bit more academic, I wanna talk about the, the strategy that the writer employs uh, at the end of this story. So this story is written in third person, what I call third person limited, meaning that it's, it's really hovering, right? It's not first person from, from Mathilde's point of view, but really we're hovering around sort of the, the mental attitude of this character so we know some of her thoughts and some of her, her feelings. And nothing is discovered in the narrative until Mathilde discovers it. Meaning that the narrator never says, oh, Mathilde lost the diamonds in the carriage or they fell out onto the dance floor. Uh, so we never learn where the diamonds are, and we never learn that the diamonds are fake until the very end when Mathilde learns of that revelation. If you're a student in my class, you've probably already read The Lottery, and The Lottery is an interesting example of a third-person narrative that is not limited to one particular character. In The Lottery, there's a situation that's going on that the characters are very much aware of and we the reader we're we're kept at a distance we don't discover until the very end of the story the real nature of the lottery what the lottery is if you haven't read it you want to read the lottery but i'll give you a hint the lottery does not involve winning a lot of money it's not it's not a good thing to win there i've said too much but the point is in the lottery all of the characters know what is at stake in regard to the lottery, but we, the reader, we don't know until the very end. Whereas in the necklace, we are in the mindset of Matilda. It's not told first person, it's not her point of view, but we're very closely linked to Matilda. So we sense what is important to her, we sense what is at risk to her, and we also sense what she is prideful about by the end. So whether you like her character or not, we are privy to her emotional well-being every step of the way until the very last moment of the story. Because the story ends with a line of dialogue from her friend saying, hey, oh, those diamonds, they're paste, it's fake, whoops. And then we don't get to know how she responds. What does Mathilde say next? What does she do? Does she go home and cry to her husband? Does she, does she shut up about it and never tell a soul? Does she beg her friend to give her some money to replace the, the 10 years of, of misfortune? Does she just have a good old laugh or does she lose her mind? We don't know. And so the author is letting us fill in the details if we want to do that. So we get this strong emotional impact, we get this revelation, but we don't get to see, through the narrative at least, we don't get to see and learn exactly how she responds. And so part of the work of the storytelling and part of the fun of creation is handed over to us, the reader, because we get to imagine 
what this fictional character that doesn't exist, we get to sort of imagine, oh, what does she go home and tell her husband? Or how does she react? Or does she slap her friend? Does she run off crying? You'll notice in short fiction, there are a lot of authors who have done this. They, they provide this, this moment where we we figure something out, or we understand the twist, or we get the moment of surprise, and there could be more resolution, more denouement, to use another French word. But instead, we just get that climactic moment, and then the, the narrative is cut from there, and we are left to decide, how do we want to fill in the gap? How do we want to fill in the details? How do we want to, in our own mind, extend that resolution? So those are a few of my thoughts on the necklace. And I would love to know, one, what do you think happens after the ending of the story? How do you think Matilde reacts when she learns the truth about that necklace that she lost? And also, do you know of any other stories or books or, or movies that do this, that give you this, this emotional impact at the end and then let you sort of figure out, oh, you know, what, what happens next? Okay, I think that wraps everything up. If you have any stories or books or plays or poems that you'd like me to read and analyze, leave a comment and let me know.